feeling tired, fatigued, run down, you just don't have the up and go that you used to, but you're wanting to do so many things, well, this is the episode for you. We are talking about the powerhouse of ourselves, the mitochondria, and we're going to be talking about how you can renovate your mitochondria so that you can have optimal energy. And yes, you've landed on the Me and My Health Up podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Harcher. I'm a clinical nutritionist and lifestyle medicine specialist. The purpose of this podcast is to enhance and enlighten your well-being. And today, I'm going to be doing that just for you. And we're going to be talking about energy and how you can get more energy into your day. And it's all around the mitochondria. So the mitochondria, what is it? It's the powerhouse of our cell. It is what gives our cells energy. It is a cell within a cell. So it's an organelle and it originates from bacteria. So one bacteria engulfed another bacteria. And so there's bacteria residing in bacteria. And that's how we evolved into who we are today from this powerhouse cell called the mitochondria. And so it generates our power. However, when it's not looked after, and there's plenty of things that you could do to not look after it. So we're going to be talking about those things not to do as well. But we're going to be talking about how to optimize the function of the mitochondria. And it really has an implication on all areas of health and well-being, not only energy. It will affect your mental health, your heart health, your cardiovascular health, and your physical health in terms of your muscular skeletal system. It has a broad, it has an effect all over your body, in particularly those organs that require lots of energy, such as your brain and your heart. They're energy, energy consumers, and they need a lot of energy to run effectively. And when our mitochondria isn't functioning well, nor is our heart, our brain, and our muscular skeletal system. So we need to get this back on track. As we get older, our mitochondria function generally starts to decline. It's efficiency. So the mitochondria is still there, but the efficiency of the mitochondria declines with age. But we can do something about this. We can actually be proactive and slow degradation, or we slow the rate of efficiency loss, and we can up our efficiency by doing certain things, which I'm certainly going to cover. So how does the mitochondria create energy? Or how does it fuel us? Well, it all starts with electrons. It needs electrons. There's the electron transport chain, which generates ATP. So we need to put electrons into our electron transport chain. And electrons come from many forms, not just food. So yes, food ultimately breaks down to electrons, hydrogen, and the hydrogen contains electrons and protons. So carbohydrates have less hydrogen ions than what fat does. So fat's a much longer molecule. It has more hydrogen ions than a carbohydrate. So a fat molecule contains more electrons. It has more electrons, it can send down the electron transport chain and produce more ATP. So we can generate more energy from fat. Carbohydrates doesn't have as many. Protein has a bit more. It's uh, it's not much, I mean, in terms of energy equivalent, it is the energy equivalent to carbohydrates. So yes, the fat does prevail in terms of the number of electrons and the protein, yes, similar to carbohydrates. And yes, what we do, we extract electrons from these food sources. So these food sources ultimately break down to acetyl-CoA and acetyl-CoA goes into the Krebs cycle. And the Krebs cycle, also known as the TCA cycle, the uh, citric acid cycle, that whole cycle is essentially wanting to make sure we've got the right hydrogen attached to the carbohydrate to the carbon. Um, and so what, what it's doing is replacing the hydrogen in order to make sure that we've got the right hydrogen to be feeding into the electron transport chain. So I spoke about this in a previous episode in relation to deuterium, which is an isotype of hydrogen. So an isotope, it's similar. It's the same, but it's got a different molecular weight. So with deuterium, it's heavy. It's got an extra neutron in 
the um, nucleus. And that extra neutron makes it twice as heavy as proteum. So proteum is what we want. And the reason why I'm discussing deuterium in this episode on mitochondria is because carbohydrates tend to have more of the the deuterium. So they have more of the deuterium bound to it. So when we consume excess amounts of carbohydrates, what we do is clog up that that Krebs cycle that's trying to replace uh, the deuterium with proteum. So yes, there is proteum majority, you know, it's majority on the carbohydrate molecule. However, there is some deuterium. And depending on how, what sort of food you ate, whether it was highly processed, if it's more processed, it's going to contain more deuterium. And this will clog up the Krebs cycle. And so with the Krebs cycle, we only get two ATP generated from it. The rest of it comes from the electron transport chain. And, that, and that's where we produce a lot more ATP. So if we clog up the Krebs cycle, we produce very little energy from it. And then we're sending very little energy down the, or electrons down the electron transport chain. And hence why a low carbohydrate diet works really well, because you're not clogging up the Krebs cycle. <laughs> um, and what we can do is run the citric acid cycle efficiently, get real proteum down the electron transport chain, sending the electron down the electron transport chain and pumping out the protons. And that is where we can then generate ATP with ATPase. And so what we need to do is really reduce our carbohydrates in order to run this cycle really efficiently. So this is why high fat diets, low carbohydrate diets are really effective and getting great results with people. And why people have got more energy is because fat is more deuterium depleted. It contains less deuterium, a whole lot less deuterium, whereas carbohydrates contain more. And so when we consume excess carbohydrates, we are slowing down this cycle to generate energy. So I really didn't understand the keto diet and why it was so effective until I understand understood this story around the mitochondria and the impact deuterium has on the mitochondria and how it's like a real heavy, heavy molecule that just can't move through the cycle essentially, effectively, and it clogs it up. It builds up. It builds up. It's like a dam. It just keeps building up and it's not allowing. And eventually the dam spills over and spills over electrons and they're not actually getting down to the electron transport chain and creating ATP, which is the energy our cell uses. So the number one takeaway is to reduce carbohydrates, really minimize carbohydrates. You want to increase fat consumption because we can generate more efficient energy through fat burning. So yes, we prefer fat uh, in, in terms of being uh, driving an efficient mitochondria. We really want to consume more fat. We need protein. We need protein because it's the basis of life. It's the building block of life. So we need to be up. We need the protein, the essential amino acids in order to make things. So we want to consume protein, high fat. So the, I guess, a moderate amount of protein, high fat, really low carbohydrates, as low as you can get them. And this is, includes fruit because the other thing I didn't realize is that fruit's rich in deuterium. So not only highly processed foods are rich in deuterium, you also have fruit that's really high in deuterium. Because what plants do through photosynthesis, so deuterium naturally resides in the environment at 150 parts per million thereabouts. And so the plant is taking in deuterium via water. So the plant, what it does is it sends the deuterium when it's doing photosynthesis, it sends the deuterium to the fruits or to the tubular vegetables. And so the vegetables, the tubular ones, such as potatoes, sweet potato, pumpkin, all these beetroot, carrots, they're all really high in deuterium. So yeah, they're great for young kids who need to grow, but for adults that can't use deuterium as well as kids, because we use deuterium in our structure. It's bound heavily to collagen. This is why adults shouldn't be consuming large amounts of collagen. So there's this big collagen fad that's going on at the moment, really pushing collagen for skin health. But in actual fact, it's really slowing down energy production within the system. And ultimately, when our energy system no longer works, we die. We don't survive anymore. 
And so it's a really a story around mitochondria. And then with fasting, fasting helps us generate uh, more efficiently because we're not clogging up our system. We're slowing the system down. We're not putting too much fuel in the system. And when we don't put too much fuel in the system, the system gets more efficient. And this is why fasting and intermittent fasting is producing great results for people is because of the mitochondria story. And secondly, because you're forcing your body to burn fat and fat has really low deuterium content. So this is starting to piece together a puzzle that I couldn't quite ever get my head around because I just didn't understand it until I understood this picture around the mitochondria function. I knew about the mitochondria, but I had no idea about deuterium, the isotope, or the hydrogen isotope. I thought, water was water. I thought hydrogen was hydrogen. I didn't realize there was different elements of hydrogen that would could affect our health so much. So reduce carbohydrates, encourage fasting. So have periods of fasting to improve efficiency, reduce carbohydrates, improve efficiency, eat more saturated fats. So up your fats, polyunsaturated and saturated fats, really, really good to drive mitochondria efficiency. And those fats, you want to make sure that they're not heavily processed, such as like not having margarine as a fat, choosing butter over margarine. So the less processed it is, the better it is for you. Ghee is a fantastic uh, form of fat. And then you've got all the taro, which is beef fat. And then you've got lard, which is pig fat. All these fats are actually really good fuel for the body. The Sherpas in the Himalayas, how they climb the mountain is with ghee. They, they're just consuming ghee. They're also, and I haven't mentioned this, they're also extracting electrons from the earth. The earth so the earth is negatively charged. And so we, when we earth ourselves, where we put our bare foot to the ground or our palms to the ground, we actually take in electrons from the earth. So the earth's negative charge. And so we can get electrons through earthing. This is why when you're walking outside and walking around with bare feet, you won't feel as hungry or you won't feel the need that you need to get energy from food. That will be lessened. So if you want to eat less, spend more time outside and outdoors barefoot in sunlight because sunlight is it really helps power the mitochondria so it it's particularly the infrared light so the infrared light is really important and that's the heat part of sun so that the heat the, the warmth you feel that heat is infrared we can't see it but we feel it it's the warmth and that that infrared light helps charge separate water within our body to create easy water and that's another way when we charge separate water we create protons and electrons positive and negative charges and what does a battery have a positive and negative charge but it needs infrared light to charge it up and so we can charge up the water in our body and then we don't need to eat as much. So if we're getting sunlight and getting the infrared light, we still need UV light. But if you want to get the infrared without as much UV, well, then obviously the morning, the very morning sunlight is the best. It's got less UV light, but we still need UV light. We need UV light to synthesize vitamin D. And vitamin D is critical for mitochondria function. And so in actual fact, we need the broad spectrum of light, the full spectrum of light, the non-visible and the visible spectrum of light. So ultraviolet light is part of the non-visible spectrum. Infrared is part of the non-visible spectrum. And we need them both to support the mitochondria, to drive the efficiency of the mitochondria so that it's getting more electrons. So when we get infrared light, we get the phase separation of water and we excite that, we create a battery effect and all the water in our in us is powering us as well. And so getting sunlight, getting the infrared light, making sure we're having water in our body, we're not dehydrated. And if we eat fat, we actually produce more metabolic water. So how cool is that? So we eat fat, not only gives us more electrons, but we produce more water from fat. So we produce more H2O, deuterium depleted H2O when we eat fat. And this is just amazing in terms of getting energy, creating more deuterium depleted water and really helping our body then drive more efficiency, more efficiency of the mitochondria, getting it working better for us. Now, some of the other really important things that help with mitochondria 
besides getting light. So making sure you get the infrared light and the UV light. We need the UV light. We want to make sure we get produced melanin, melanin in our skins. And that's what is provides us the protection from the UV light. It actually bounces off the UV light, but it absorbs all the infrared, those, yeah, the, the spectrums that aren't UV into our body. It bounces off the UV and we still get the UV that we need in order to help the body synthesize vitamin D. So you can see how all nature's working with us together to actually create a really efficient system. And if we utilize by getting regular sun exposure throughout the day so getting morning sun and the morning getting the morning sun helps protect us more during the midday sun but we need the midday sun we do it's incredible hey we need it for dopamine uh, we need it for dopamine production and so you've probably heard about dopamine dopamine is that reward and recognition neurotransmitter it's what we look forward to we get that anticipatory sort of response which is a build-up of dopamine in order to get something so we if we're like if we're thinking about food for example and where we're going to eat the dopamine will start to build up and it start to accumulate and will, it will give us the motivation so dopamine's like that motivation to desire something something that we want we need uv light to create the dopamine so it's a full light story we need the full spectrum but we again it's finding the right amount depending on your skin type and where you are in the world. So I'm not saying spend all day in the sun, do it wisely, get the morning sun, get the infrared light, then that's going to build up some more tolerance to the midday sun. And then just get five minutes in the midday sun. And that five minutes is enough. What the science says is we need at least 30 minutes of the UV light per 30 minutes per week. Okay, so that's really a day less than five minutes a day, four minutes a day in the midday sun. So make sure you get that morning sun, get the infrared light so that we actually create that battery effect through splitting water and we can generate uh, energy through the splitting of water through our batteries when we separate water and that requires infrared light. And so we want to make sure we're hydrated as well. We want to eat less carbohydrates so that we're sending more efficient fuel into our body that we can then produce more ATP, ultimately more energy. We then want to get cold exposure because what happens with the electron transport chain, a chain of protein together, cytochromes together, protein molecules together. And what can happen is separation can happen between these cytochromes and electrons leak out through the cytochrome. And in order to keep that coupled, if we get cold exposure, it provides like a compression, not only the body compresses, <laughs> it the mitochondria, the cells compress, but also the mitochondria compresses and it gets that electron transport chain coupled and we get good flow of electrons through this electron transport chain, maximizing ATP production. So getting regular cold exposure is really good for us. So doing this on a regular basis and it's getting to a point where it's uncomfortable. So this is why it's so healthy to be uncomfortable at times, not to the point where it's uncomfortable, uncomfortable, uncomfortable that you're like, you know, you go into hypothermia. It's more getting to encouraging that shivering in the body. So whatever temperature gives you that shivering, and obviously you'll get more cold adapted the more cold exposure you get. But it can be just going outside on a relatively cold day and wearing less layers and spending a bit more time outside and feeling the cold. Actually feeling cold is good. We want our muscles to shiver. We want to create that thermogenesis in our brown fat. We want to drive the mitochondria and work it and to get that coupling effect of the electron transport chain so we can really create a strong, efficient mitochondria. So getting regular cold exposure is really helpful as well. The other part is the sleep to obviously do the restoration, the repair work. So we need our sleep to repair the mitochondria. So making sure we're getting a good night's sleep is really important to repair the mitochondria. And the other part of this is exercise as well, because when our body's forced to you know, create 
energy and more energy and there's there's like stress demands to create more energy so it's a a stressor on the body what we call hormetic stress so this is a, a natural stress on the body and it's and we're designed to get these hormetic stresses such as the cold exposure or the hot exposure or in this case the activity exposure so that heightened activity for a period of time gets the body to create energy. And of course, the body's going to then drive efficiencies around creating that energy because you're asking more of it. You're saying, well, create energy. It's going, well, yeah, I'm go- I've got to create more, more and more and more. And I've got to get efficient at this because you're asking more. And so regular exercise really helps with driving that mitochondria efficiency. So on the exercise, making sure we're doing that a regular, look, it doesn't need to be everyday high intensity training, but regular activity so that you're creating an extra demand on the body beyond the resting metabolic rate. So just creating that spike in demand through whether it be walking or it could be high intensity training, but actually creating an additional demand on the body, a hormetic stress on the body, just like we did with the cold exposure. Saunas, for example. So Exercise, the other thing, good thing about exercise is it's going to help drive out deuterium. So yes, we will build up some deuterium and deuterium becomes a problem when it's in excess. It's just like anything in excess. We don't want excessive amounts of insulin. You've probably heard of insulin insensitivity or excessive insulin. Your doctor might might have mentioned excessive insulin production. We don't want excessive insulin production. We don't want excessive of anything, and we don't want deficient of anything. We want the Goldilocks principle of just right. So yes, deuterium is going to get into our system, but we've got ways of eliminating deuterium and stopping it accumulating. So one of the ways is not to eat excessive calories or not to eat excessive carbohydrates, not to eat excessive fruit, or not to eat excessive starchy vegetable consumption. That's going to minimize the amount of deuterium coming in. But when there is inadvertently deuterium going to come in through you drinking water, right? When you drink water, you're going to be drinking two drops per liter of deuterium in that water. And so our body has got a mechanism to get rid of it. We get rid of it through our feces. And guess who? what loves deuterium? Flies. They, they want it for the rapid development and so that they can replicate and keep procreating so that they stay alive in this world and they can continue to feed flies and reptiles and uh, lizards and things like that. Um, and so it helps feed the food chain. And, and the other thing is our gut bacteria in our stomach. So our gut bacteria also likes deuterium. So it uses deuterium as fuel to produce some of the butyrates and the the propionates that our then we use that are better fuel for us. So it's really incredible how bacteria helps us break down something that in excess is is dangerous to us, really, because uh, it's really going to slow down mitochondria function and uh, affect our ability to function and affect our ability to run our systems, such as the immune system, and and keep away the nasties, the viruses and bacteria. And yes, the viruses love deuterium and so when we've got excessive amounts of deuterium it finds our way into our saliva and the viruses will have an affinity to rich deuterium saliva and so if we have depleted or healthy levels so healthy levels of deuterium in our body is around like disease is not found at less than 130 parts per million in your body no disease greater than so in our we'll typically have somewhere like where most people lie is somewhere between 140 and 145 in the environment between 150 and 155 and so yes we have this ability to deplete it and the more we can deplete it and keep it down in our system of course we're going to produce more efficient mitochondria and have more energy on top of that we're going to significantly reduce the risk of getting sick and getting any type of disease such as cardiovascular disease or Alzheimer's or dementia. So this ties into mitochondria function ties into heart disease, dementia, Parkinson's, autism. It's even linked to autism. And so the more we can, ADHD is another one. Uh, It's been linked to ADHD too for mitochondria function. 
So the more we can focus on getting this mitochondria working for us by keeping the deuterium down, and the way we do that is through uh, getting regular bowel motions, sweating. So that's where exercise and saunas are really helpful. Sweating out, we'll sweat out the deuterium. Breathing, so making sure we're breathing well, effectively, and getting, so we breathe out deuterium, we breathe in oxygen. And so that's another way we get it out. So breathing exercises can be really helpful for reducing deuterium. I mentioned exercise, sauna. I also, another way to deplete it is through cold exposure. So cold exposure really helps drive that mitochondrial efficiency, helps it get rid of deuterium. So it's really helpful to get more cold exposure, not only to improve the efficiency of the mitochondria in terms of coupling of the cytochromes, but also to get rid of deplete deuterium. And guess what else really helps with sun exposure? So with those around the equator, they've got lots of sources of deuterium around them, such as coconut water um, and all these fruits that are available, all these tropical fruits that are rich in deuterium. So the people living around the equator, but they, the benefit they have is lots of sun exposure. And so they'll deplete it through the, if they get the sun exposure, they'll deplete deuterium. So it's really, really important to get, get our sun exposure, get our cold exposure, get our hot exposure, move our body and really making sure our, you know, getting our sleep to drive the mitochondria. So it's really a holistic approach that's really going to get your mitochondria working well. The other thing that I need to mention, because it's really important, is that in the mitochondria, there's a oxidation reduction, oxidation reduction reaction that's happening through the mitochondria, through the electron transport chain. So there's a constant process of oxidation and reduction. That To get that nice flow between oxidation and reduction, means that we need to be in a very centered state. So when we're in a real oxidative state, such as when we're overly stressed or you know we're not getting the relaxation time to do the reduction, we out of balance. And so this is why it's really important to have that supportive lifestyle. And in terms of mindset, having a real balanced mindset, and I've spoken about achieving a balanced mindset, and not having a polarized point of view or a polarized judgment on someone, that polarization creates an imbalance in the body and, and will find its way down to a cellular level where the cell can't do the, the redox re reduction well enough and it just finds itself in an oxidative state and it's not doing the, the nice flow of electrons down the electron transport chain. And so we're, we're losing electrons and this creates decoupling of the cytochromes, which I mentioned before, and how cold brings the cytochromes together and allows the nice flow of electrons to maximize the amount of ATP generated. We get the decoupling when we've got the imbalance between oxidation and reduction, and that can come when we're judging people, when we're resenting people, or when we're feeling that we're the best in the world, we've got too much pride about us and we look down on others and we've got excessive pride uh, and we're not being ourselves. When we're our authentic selves, that's when we've got that nice balance of the autonomics, which allows that nice uh, balance between oxidation and reduction at a cellular level down to the mitochondria level. So we need to have that balanced mindset. We need to, if we're feeling uh, like we're judging someone, then we, we need to look at, okay, what am I judging them for? We need to look for the benefits of what we're perceiving as a negative trait that, or something they've done towards us. If we have that perception, then we need to look at the benefits. If we think it's a bad thing that they've done, we need to see the benefits to get the balanced autonomics. We need to look at when we've done it, to own it in ourselves so that we no longer have that judgment in others. So to actually own that trait in ourselves, own it within ourselves, see the benefit of it if we think it's a negative trait or if we think it's a positive trait to see the downsides of the trait to balance the mind, to balance the mind which balances the autonomics, which balances us at a cellular level. 
and allows that flow of electrons down the electron transport chain, which maximizes ATP production. So I've shared a lot and I've shared it in a holistic context, which is really important because we don't want to lose sight that this is just a low carbohydrate story or this is just a fasting story. Yes, fasting helps calorific uh, reduction or restriction helps. Yes, low carbohydrates helps, but it means we need to consume more fats. It still means we need to consume protein. We also need to then have that supportive lifestyle. There's no point of doing the intermittent fasting well, doing the low carbohydrate well, if we're not sleeping at night because we're resenting someone. We, we don't like someone and we're judging them. If we're doing that, we're not getting a good sleep at night. We're not doing the restoration to the mitochondria at night to allow it to then perform the next day. So we need to do all these things. We need to, you know, we need to move our bodies in order to create efficiencies in the mitochondria. We need to get that regular cold exposure. So yes, we need to get uncomfortable. And we need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Hormetic stress is good for us. We just don't want it to be around forever that we can't cope with it. But having enough, that Goldilocks, not too much, not too little, just right. So this is a journey. And, and again, this is why I'm not sort of being really prescriptive around how many carb, you know, carbohydrates to protein. It's just reducing what you're currently having so that you're encouraging metabolic flexibility and so that you're going to be switching between burning carbohydrates and fats. And over time, you'll be able to reduce it at your pace that you can do it at. That's why I'm not saying that you've got it overnight, do 50 I can only consume 50 grams of carbohydrates. If you just slowly start minimizing your carbohydrates and then just slowly reducing your calorie consumption on a daily basis, it's easy to do. And so I'm always doing the steps. I'm stepping it, stepping it all the time. So I was doing calorific restriction by just eating less per day. So reducing the amount I ate per meal, but I was having three meals a day. And yes, I was doing a variation of time restricted feeding, such as probably on average doing about 14 hour fast and a 12 hour eating window. That was probably the average. And now I've cut three meals a day down to two meals. So I'm just progressively, and then I've increased the fasting period. So the fasting period's gone up to 16 hours. I'm eating within an eight hour window, but only two meals. And so I'm just slowly, methodically, and then I'm playing around with exercise. So for example, I love exercise and I'm seeing how much the performance of my exercise being affected by the calorie reduction. And so I'm playing around with how many calories do I need for the amount of exercise to be able to perform well, because I want to perform my exercise well. I'm always striving to achieve goals around exercise. So I'm playing with this. And what I found is pulsing works really well. So if you're reducing carbohydrates, you're doing a bit of caloric restriction, you're doing a bit of time restrictive feeding, what you want to do is then have a day where you're not doing it or two days of not doing it. And so it's like that then introducing the five and two, for example. So you have five on days where you're doing the, you know, for me, it's two meals a day and 16 hour fasts, something like that for five days a week. And then two days, I'm just going back to three meals and not doing a time restrictive feeding. And what I'm finding is that pulsating is working well with the body. So because the body wants that flexibility, it wants to be able to do both. And again, we can lose efficiencies when we're not using something. So it's that use it or lose it principle. So I'm not encouraging for you to go all out, 100% all out on just keto, low carbohydrates, low deuterium foods, time restrictive feeding, coal, all that sort of stuff. Just gradually introduce parts of what I've mentioned. It could be just getting, so each morning I'm getting the morning sunshine and that's working well. I'm loving getting the, that morning rising sunshine, getting a bit of thinking time, watching it rise, getting my body exposed. So I got my, I get my body exposed in the morning. I can tolerate a whole lot of UV light during the midday, which is fantastic because I'm able to, you know, produce dopamine, which gets me the results that I want in my business and in my life. 
So it's really important that we find this nice balance that works for you. So start small and build on it, work on it. Start in the area, whether it be light, just getting more light exposure, or whether it be just looking at reducing the amount of deuterium that you're eating. I've just produced a blog post, which I can attach to this. I can attach the blog post to this so you can look at the deuterium or the deuterium low foods and then how to, to deplete deuterium. So I can include that blog post in the show notes. Yeah, so just start looking at these little ways in terms of like sauna, what the studies are saying is 57 minutes per week. So 57 minutes per week of a 90 degree plus sauna. So around that 90, 95 degrees, 57 minutes per week. So you could do three to four sessions of 10 to 15 minutes. In terms of cold, 11 minutes per week. And having that temperature somewhere, well, it's a temperature that makes you shiver. Uh, so it's so what you want is get that gasp upon entering the water or you know the exposure of cold air outside, that gasp, oh, it's cold. And then you want to stay in it long enough just to feel a bit of a shiver. Uh, no, not, not, you know, shivering for hours, but just getting it, getting yourself to the point of shivering. And then you'll find you build up more brown fat, you get more cold adapted and you can last longer in the cold. Uh, you'll be able to find that you'll, you'll adapt to the sauna too. So yeah, so just doing that 57 minutes per week in the sauna, 11 minutes in the cold exposure. The, in terms of UV light, I mentioned it's 30 minutes per week of UV light. So that's the midday light that you want to get a minimum amount of and obviously work up towards it. The infrared light, well, if you get the sunrise, then you could get the first two hours of sunrise because that's got really low UV. So you could even start with just an hour, just getting that first sunrise for the, for the hour, go for a walk at sunrise and maximize skin exposure to the sunrise. Uh, so yeah, maximizing your skin exposure to the sunlight. And that also applies to indoors. So non-native EMFs, such as those coming from screens, uh, such as from mobiles, you want to minimize the exposure of the body to them. So this is why I wear the blue light blocking filters on the you know, the glasses. And then I've also got the filtering on the screen. And on top of that, I'll generally wear more clothes so that I'm protected. My skin's protected because our skin also has these sensors, right? So it senses light and it senses non-native EMFs. Non-native EMFs are disruptive on our, our time system in terms of our clock, our circadian rhythm and the clocks within our body. Uh, so in terms of the way in which the systems interact and function and the communication between systems can be affected by non-native EMF. So really minimizing that non-native EMF exposure will also help with the harmonious, harmonious discussion that the organs have and need between one another. So that's really it. In this session, I mean, I could talk for hours, and but I'll, I'll have another session. There's going to be a lot more sessions on this as I dig deeper into mitochondria health, into quantum health, and how you can really up your health, health up to the next level. So we're going to the next level. We've got be below that atomic level. We're at that subatomic level where we're talking protons and electrons and photons. Photons is what uh, light uh, sends to us, so particles of light. And we're going to do a lot more of this year, of this in 2024, because I'm really wanting to up your health. I'm upping my health. I've, as, as I was sharing all my changes, I've actually written a blog, which I can share that in the show notes of this episode blog around the benefits, the results that I've achieved within this two months of doing this. So two months of doing the hot, cold, uh, I've only done the diet for about two weeks, one, one just over a week now, and significant changes in terms of cholesterol, blood glucose, blood pressure, weight loss, weight circumference loss. Yeah, so everything's going in the right direction as a result of doing this. Energy has had its highs and also I've had its lows, but then I've realized that's when I've introduced a bit more carbohydrate to pick me up. So I'm finding that nice pulsing that works for me. So I've got a more steady energy. So I did hit a real low 
with energy after a bit of time. So I had that good energy for a while. And then I was having too much demand on the body and not enough energy coming in from sunlight, from water, from food, from the earth. Uh, so I didn't have enough electrons. So I'm finding that nice balance between my demands for ATP and the body uptaking electrons to create more ATP. So that's it for today's episode on the mitochondria and how to power up your cells and power up your life so that you have you go to the next level, the next orbital, the next level of healthing up. So I really appreciate you listening in. I'm running a course this year, which I'm launching at the beginning of the year. I also share links to that in the show notes. It's the Holistic Mind Mastery Program, 12-week program. It can be done, you know, it can be done remotely, put it that way. And so it is predominantly a remote program. But if you're around the eastern suburbs, there'll be elements, part of it that is done face to face. But those doing it remotely won't miss out on anything. It's probably just more the getting the early morning sunrise, getting the and doing that together. And yeah, so just getting together if you're around the eastern suburbs. But if you're remote, you can still do the program because the program is actually built for people doing it remotely. And it's holistically. So everything that I talk about, it's a holistic program to really help mind mastery so that you can ultimately master your life. So that's it for today's episode. I really appreciate you tuning in. It's New Year's Eve. I hope you have a fantastic New Year's Eve for me when I'm recording this. However, when you're listening to this, it probably it certainly won't be New Year's Eve. So I hope you've had a great start to the new year and looking forward to enlightening you in 2024 and really helping you health up. Thank you. Podcast disclaimer. This podcast and any information, advice, opinions, or statements within it do not constitute medical, healthcare, or professional advice and are provided for general information purposes only. All care is taken in the preparation of the information in this podcast. Connected Wellness Proprietary Limited, operating under the brand Me and My Health Up, does not make any representations or give any warranties about its accuracy, reliability, completeness, or suitability for any particular purpose. This podcast and any information, advice, opinions, or statements within it are not to be used as a substitute for professional, medical, psychological, psychiatric, or any other mental health care or health care in general. Me and My Health Up recommends you seek the advice of a doctor or qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Inform your doctor of any changes that you made to your lifestyle and discuss these with your doctor. Do not disregard medical advice or delay visiting a medical professional because of something you hear in this podcast. This podcast has been carefully prepared on the basis of current information. Changes in circumstances after publication may affect the accuracy of this information. To the maximum extent permitted by the law, Me and My Health Up disclaims any such representations or warranties to the completeness, accuracy, merchantability, or fitness for purpose of this podcast and will not be liable for any expenses, losses, damages, incurred indirect or consequential damages or costs that may be incurred as a result of the information being inaccurate or incomplete in any way and for any reason. No part of this podcast can be reproduced, redistributed, published, copied, or duplicated in a form without prior permission of me and my health up.